Hello, welcome to Monday. It's actually Labor Day. So it's, um, I thought it was Sunday. <laughs> Tonight it's Monday. My topic today, hello, it's Cheryl Anderson here. Uh -huh. My topic today is, um, can your circle of friends help you live longer? Now, I was just reading um, an article by Dr. Bruce Lipton, who, when I first heard about him, Hi, Sandy. How are you doing? Um, I was right into science. I love science. And I, I knew about stem cell research, you know, and I thought it was pretty modern. You know, I thought it was about, you know, the turn of the century, 2001, I think it was, I first read about it. In fact, Dr. Bruce Lipton has been studying stem cells since the 1950s. Uh, in how cells work in certain environments. It's an amazing study, an amazing study. It's now called epigenetics, all right, um, which is just opening up doors and, and volumes of amazing information to help us understand ourselves better and also how that we can, how we can change who we are, our health, our well-being through our environment, all right? So... He did, uh, when I first, the first video I saw of him was he was talking about um, stem cells. Now, stem cells are clone cells, all right? They're all exactly the same. Now, initially, stem cells they were getting from human embryos way back when I first started hearing about it. Then next thing, they got better with testing. Science moved forwards. They could get stem cells out of the nostrils. Now they can just take, they can get stem cells out of pretty much everything. So it's not such a sketchy thing anymore. But what the studies he did was he had Petri dishes or Petri dishes, however you want to pronounce that. They're the little round ones they, like they do, um, when they grow bacteria and different things in them. You know, you see them on, you know, um, NCIS, stuff like that, all the science-y shows. Now, what he found was he put stem cells in different um, Petri dishes and he subjected them to different environments, some acidic, some with heat, some with, um, you know, I, I can't remember to be perfectly honest. I was so captivated by what I was reading and hearing now, what happened was a stem cell can be made into an ear, a nose, a bit of tissue, um, skin. It's very, very clever. Now, how they make this, these different things, and you make a nose or skin, comes from how they treat the this, this stem cell, what they do with it, all right? So it's a blank. Yet yeah, they can then, from that, through environment, through what they put in or what they do to the stem cell, the outcome is something different each time, right, depending what they wanted. So it showed that through environment alone, we change who we are. Like we're made up of all of these cells, all right? What he further went on to explain was where we put ourselves, the environments that we put ourselves or place ourselves or that we find ourselves in, whether we're stuck or we're just ended up there, is a huge indicator as to how healthy we will be, how well we will function in our life, with our families, with our friends, in our jobs. Now, let me put an example. You imagine taking one child and putting him in the house of people that scream, that there's uh, discord, they don't get fed properly, they're constantly being spoken down to, they are not cared for. So you can imagine doctors could do a barrage of tests, heart, brain, lungs, cells, blood, you name it, the whole lot. The child would not come out healthy, all right? They would be already showing signs of degenerative disease, yes, at five years old, yes. They would also show stress levels, which is cortisol, you can see in the body, that's our, what happens, fight or flight, when we get a shock and off we go, we fill up with that. It's very toxic. It has a really negative effect on us. If we're not running away from a bear <laughs> or a lion or, I don't know, an axe murderer or something, something that's made us take off. Now, if you put a child into an environment where there's food, 
air, water, loving environment. Their needs are catered to, you know, you're getting bathed daily, you're being fed, you're being spoken to nicely, you have human touch. If you test that same child with the same equipment, the same doctors, the same everything, you're going to get an, ex an opposite, full opposite reaction. You're going to find the test put out a much healthier child, a really well-balanced child, a child who br whose brain function is normal to above normal. This is because the environments that we are in, regardless of our age, will dictate how healthy we are or how unhealthy we are. Now, I mean healthy in your mind, in your spirit, in your body, in your dreams. Some people, you know, if you're in a healthy environment, you have really healthy, fantastic dreams. Oh, I want to do this. I want to go there. Oh, this is great. Yeah. But if you're in a really horrible, oppressive, crappy environment, what's your dreams? You probably don't even have any. Why would you have any? You can't see any brightness. Everything's just crap. So what happens to the human form in that incident is everything implodes and goes negative. So in the topic today, like can your circle of friends help you live longer? All right. It's okay. Family, we have family. We fall into routines and patterns with family. They can be changed, but a lot of the time we don't because there's always more story involved in what's going on than what can be seen. All right. Because we all have history with family, you know, um, immediate family or, you know, cousins, uncles, all that sort of business. So the environment that we put ourselves in by choice, which is our friends, is really a leading factor in our well-being, our mental and physical health, and also our longevity. There was a talk on TED. I don't know if people have seen this or not. It's a, you can TED. It's um, all different people on stage. I think it's at a university somewhere. I'm, I'm not sure. But they talk about everything, every topic you could possibly think about. It's fantastic. Now, one woman was presenting a talk. Sometimes they go for 10 minutes, sometimes 20, half an hour. Hers was on, they did studies on people over, I think it was a 30-year period, um, case studies. Now, case studies are what's really important. If you want to know if something's working, you're looking for the case study, right? Because this is when someone gets someone from one point and then they study them again as time goes on, right? So same person testing, same person being the uh, person tested. So what they found, and they went through all the contributing factors that made up a healthy adult to what made an unhealthy adult. Now, as the story went on, of course, they approached stuff like your food, you know, like your nutrition, your exercise, you know, were they getting out? Were they a smoker? Were they a non-smoker? Were they a drinker? Were they a non-drinker? You know, we've heard all this before, right? It's not unusual. We all know what things aren't great for our health. <laughs> we know all the things that are great for our health. The one thing that was the contributing factor to better health and longevity, and I mean like real health, like the uh, keeping away Alzheimer's, all of the degenerative diseases, like physically degenerative or neurodegenerative diseases, the one contributing factor was their friendships their community, their camaraderie with those around them. That was the one thing that set the, uh, the people they were testing, that set them apart. The ones who had a strong friend base that where, you know, you had a, close friends that you, you know, the ones we, we've got, <laughs> we can just ring up and cry. I mean, I've got a couple of friends and we've done it with each other where you just ring up and, <laughs> These things are what not made people live longer, what's the word I want, contributed to their longevity the most. Hence why the question, are your friends helping you live longer or are they like energy vampires? Are they narcissistic, you know, fair weather friends that you just, they're there for some reason, they just keep, they're in your life because you just haven't gotten rid of them yet. Now, I'm not saying who you should and should not be friends with at all. 
knock yourself out, be friends with whoever. But what's going to happen is that friendship is either going to help or harm. So if we're all looking for what's going to make us healthy and happy, how can we live longer, how can you have a better life, how can I enjoy it more, the answer is right under our noses, the friends that we keep. Now, I know the, as I've aged, the number of friends, I mean close friends, not fair weather friends and not acquaintances, because you can be very close with acquaintances and you can have wonderful relationships. Absolutely. They're even the people that if you knocked on their door at one in the morning, they would let you come and stay if you had to. You know what I mean? Like friends, friends. But the real friends, the real ones that know your pain, they've seen you when you're down, you've seen them when they're down, it's a sense of trust. Every single human needs to be able to trust outside of themselves, all right? It's really important, one, that we learn to trust ourselves. That was a big thing for me when I learned that, when I realised I actually didn't trust myself. This is about 30 years ago now. But being able to trust outside of yourself is, one, it's like sitting on a branch out on a limb, way, way out on a limb, but not feeling that you're going to fall. And yes, there's the exceptions. We can have friends for years and years and years and then they go, I've had it. I've had two turn kooky. One was really kooky. And anyway, I'm, I'm glad she's not around anymore. But so, you know, you can invest your time and energy into someone that can drop the bundle 20 years later or 30. However, my, my today, what I would say is if you're having a difficulty in your life or you're having a hard time or you feel that you're, you don't, you're not being backed up or not having much fun or you're not feeling like you can relax fully in yourself, I would say have a look at the people that you are allowing in to be your friend. And, and allowing in, I mean the ones that you treat nicely and the ones that you afford your best behavior for you know the ones that you give them that extra inch do you know yet some of them do not deserve it yet we can get a bit lazy a bit complacent and some of us especially women we don't want to look and go well they don't like you you're out we tend to not want to upset the apple cart and sometimes we start putting them at arm's reach, you know. We keep them around. It's not a lot that, like a, a man who dates women and keeps them around because he's not quite sure if there's anyone better around the corner, so he keeps them on a little lead. Sometimes we do that with our friends. Now, I recently had a situation where I did have to look at this and I have had to snip and this is someone I've known for a very, very, very long time. However, that's fine. She can do and be whatever she wants. I have no issue with that. It's not my problem. However, I did notice that being around her, bit by bit, her barbs and different things that were coming out and little, uh, I don't know, things that I wouldn't consider my friend would say or in tone, things were just getting a bit, you know, hmm. And then there was an insult that was a thinly veiled uh, insult. And I thought, I've had enough. That's it. I'm not taking this anymore. You might be an all right person 80% of the time, but I'm now fed up 100% of the time. So snip, goodbye. It was a bit hard to start off with because it felt a bit weird. And then I thought, no, I'm just not going to accept anybody in my life that wants to come and, I don't know, bring shit with them. Oh, I don't want that. I don't want that. It's not going to make me any healthier or happier. And then it, and then in turn, I become sort of, you know, <clears throat> so, you know, anyway, it's a knock-on effect, isn't it, you know? So that's my chat for this Monday, is about looking around you at those that, it's not about whether they deserve your friendship. It's not that at all. It's simply, you look at it, What what is it? 
What do they make you feel like? What do you feel like when you're around them? What do you feel like when they're gone? And hanging around in some groups is just like, and in not saying anything and in not putting an end to stuff or not putting a stop to poor behaviour, like I said in the description, is just like drinking poison in the name of the group. So you're going to keep quiet for the group. It's really not worth it at all. You can do better without these people. And in fact, you know, today comes, tomorrow comes, a month will come, a year from now will come. Eventually, you just don't even remember them anymore. You don't wish them anything but well because, you know, you just, you just don't want them around because they're negative, that's all. But you do wish that they get on with their life and be happy. That's good. But they'd be happy at a distance. <laughs> oh, my gosh, it's only 15 minutes, nearly 16. Ah! <laughs> it's not a half an hour. <laughs> Well, that's my chat for today. I'm now going to go back to my um, public holiday because I, I woke up thinking it was Sunday and it's not Sunday, it's Monday. But here in Australia, it's Labor Day. So, I mean, here it looks like, yes, like I know it's Monday, but if you could see from here down, it looks like I think it's Sunday because <laughs> I, I have Sunday clothes on. Anyway, so that's my Monday chat. Have a look, have a think. And again, it's something to teach children as well, you know. What do your friends make you feel? Where, what part of your body, when you think of your friends, what part of your body can you feel that thought? Some make you feel great. We've all got friends that make us feel great. We just They're fun, they're jolly, our energies mix together really well and there's a really lovely give and take, you know. There's no bitterness, there's no anger, there's no having to win, it's, you know, it's none of that. And then there's the friends that you're like, oh, not today. I don't really want to hang out with them today. You know, you get that feeling like some, some friends are a bit high maintenance, you know, they go on a bit, they whinge a bit, uh, all the way through to the ones that are just negative. So, you know, kids feel this. It's easier to speak to a child about what do you feel in your body? All right, because they haven't got as confused as adults do with language and perception and lies and agendas and innuendo, right? <laughs> it's a bit crazy, isn't it, being an adult? But kids, yeah, they feel it in their body. Like um, if they're in danger, they will always feel it in their abdomen or in their um, bladder. Because kids, can, you know, when they say, it made me feel like I wanted to wee. And that's exactly where fright and stuff lives is down in our gut. So, that said, I'm now going to au revoir, <laughs> go and make a cuppa and go back to slothing, <laughs> I think. <laughs> anyway, it's been lovely talking today. Take care, have a really wonderful day, and I'll be back on a Friday with a whole other new topic. Anyway, take care. Bye now. <laughs> Bye. I need to do this again because there's two buttons I have to press now to end my live video. So here's the last one. Bye now.